our next panelist is Catherine Evans. And uh, I, I first met Catherine in, a, in actually in one of our, uh, one of the audience members' living room. Maureen mm -hmm. Bayless is in the back. I hope you don't mind me mentioning you. <laughs> oh, oh, she's sitting down. I'm sorry. <laughs> in, in her front room, as a group of Parent Advisory Council chairs and, and Parent Advisory Council members gathered because in 2002, the budget cuts in Vancouver were $25 million. And for those of us who had been already working around issues as parents with questions about the adequate need for special education, for learning assistance problems in the school, this additional hit was a real serious problem. And Catherine was, I believe, at the time the chair of Point Grey or DPAC rep. Or DPAC rep, pardon me, mm -hmm. for Point Grey. She's been the uh, uh, PAC chair and a variety of different uh, positions within the parent uh, volunteer community. She currently is the president of an organization that really had its roots in that living room, mm -hmm. uh, the British Columbia Society for Public Education. She's the president of that. And without <coughs> that, would thank you, uh, Catherine, if you could address us now. Thank you, Charles. Now, I don't have the benefit of having either a teacher voice or a professor voice, so I was, I was told to use my mother voice, but uh, <laughs> the loud version of that isn't really for, fit, for company. Um, <laughs> so, um, if I may, I'll, I'll, I've put some information about the BC Society for Public Education here on the table uh, for you to pick up afterwards, if you so choose. But I'll get on right on with, um, with what I'm going to say. As I understand my role here today, it's to talk about a parent perspective, not the parent perspective, because there, of course, there's more than one parent perspective. But in this case, I'm fairly confident that my general views represent those of a majority, maybe a small majority, of parents in British Columbia. But it's nice to be on the majority side once in a while. Now, I'm going to refer to this as a strike, just in abbreviated terms, although I, I take yes. <laughs> the point well that it wasn't actually. But what it was was a pretty unusual strike. And fairly or unfairly in the past, teachers have been criticized for appearing selfish. This strike was different. Though wages were on the table, there was no way this strike could be characterized in terms of simple self-interest. For one thing, teachers went into it with no clear exit strategy. But more importantly, they went into it for reasons that the majority of parents knew and understood. The public gets public education. Most of us, if we grew up in Canada, went to public schools. And Canada is particularly good at public education. Though we are no means perfect, we do it much better than most countries and certainly better in an overall sense than our southern neighbor, the United States. And I mention them only because so much of what we hear about public education and the problem, problems in public education come to us from across the border. And we assume that the problems that are there are the problems that are here, and that is not a good assumption to make. Our education system is not perfect, but we do not have anything like the disparities in terms of resources or outcomes that exist in the United States. The design of the Canadian public edu education system is not an accident. The architect of public education in Canada, in English Canada, Edgerton Ryerson, made a number of deliberate choices that took Canadian public schools in a different direction than existed in the UK or the US. We adopted models, um, education historians in if there are any in the crowd might know this better than me, but the Netherlands and Austria were uh, the models that were adopted by Mr. Ryerson. And the result has worked for the majority of students. We all know that, can, we all know that Canadian schools produce high achieving students, but more significantly, the spread between the top and bottom of Canadian students is much narrower than in most other countries we are actually providing universal, high-quality public education. So why is there such concern about the state of public education? Why did the vast majority of teachers take such a dramatic stand to draw attention to the crisis in their classrooms? And why did so many parents stand with them? There's not just one answer. 
and there are different answers depending on who you are. But for the majority of parents who supported the teachers during the strike, the reasons had to do with their awareness of the effects of underfunding, concerns that education policy was be, were being driven by ideology, and I point here in particular to standardized testing uh, introduced at the grade 10 and 11 levels, a perception that government was engaged in an abuse of power, and a fairly long-term frustration that carefully expressed policy concerns were not being taken seriously, and in some cases were being treated as harboring a political agenda. And I will refer back to the Vancouver SOS um, experience, um, and as well our Mar Society, BCSBE. Both organizations were nonpartisan. That doesn't mean we're not political, there's, you know, there's political people involved, but we're nonpartisan. What we were working for and what the BCSPE works for is a policy change. We're not working on behalf of any political party, we're not working for any political outcome, we're working for a policy outcome. And that's an important distinction that seemed to get lost uh, in some of the media and on, unfortunately in the government. Underfunding is the biggest issue and it's one where you have the most common ground among parents. Four years ago we started SOS when there was a shortfall in funding. And I, I, it's very, the funding issue is so very confusing because yes, of course, the government does put more money into education almost every year. But the costs are rising so much faster. It's inflation and other, other costs that the small increases that are there nowhere near hold the status quo. So if you're not holding the status quo, you have to cut. And that's why we talk about it in terms of underfunding. But since we started raising concerns, and um, we gathered four, 13, between 13 and 14,000 letters from schools across the city in a matter of about three weeks, it was a pretty phenomenal organizational effort, but PAC chairs are usually pretty good at organizing things, so they did actually turn this around and gather nearly 14,000 letters expressing concern, and again, it was very carefully worded policy concerns about this underfunding and the effects that it was going to have. Since then, public awareness has increased to the point that it is generally understood that public education is underfunded. And there is, as I say, still confusion. One of the other issues is declining enrollment. And this is a factor particularly outside urban areas. And the government points to declining enrollment as another reason that there are being, that schools are closing and such. But does the, do the benefits that come from putting young children on the school bus for long drives to neighboring communities really outweigh the cost of keeping open small rural schools? Parents like me talk about underfunding and analyze the causes, but all parents see the old textbooks, the declining maintenance standards, the larger class sizes, and the general lack of resources. If they attend PAC meetings, and unfortunately fairly few do, though those who do are much more likely to engage in the discourse around public education, they will hear their principals asking for help to make a purchase that has traditionally been a school expense. And at our own school, we have paid for a voice messaging system so that the school can send messages home to parents. We've paid for a new printer in the library. We've paid for computers for the counselors. These are not things that parents normally pay for, but this is across the board happening through schools. And some PACs have turned into major fundraising machines as a result. In order to track some of the resource losses in school, the schools, our, our society started a, um, did a survey last spring, and we published it this fall. And I've got a copy here, which I can send through if people want to have a look at it. It's a secondary school tracking survey. We modeled it on a survey like this that has existed in Ontario with the group People for Education for about 
I think they've got five years or so going. But it, what it does, with very little editorializing, uh, it tracks resources available in Vancouver's high schools. And there are no surprises in here. Uh, there aren't as many teachers that support special education. There aren't as many resources in the library, even in the last three years. And that's you know, after the, big, the biggest cuts happened in 2002. So I, I can send that around if people want to have a look at that. But as I said, there's more than one reason that parents, the people are concerned about public education. There have been curriculum changes in the last few years, particularly the introduction of the new high-stakes standardized testing in grade 10 and 11. And these seem to be ideologically driven. Parents that I've talked to cannot point to a problem that these new tests were designed to fix. And unfortunately, these tests will create problems. The biggest one is that we can expect to see a decline in graduation rates over the next few years. In a recent study on graduation rates across Canada, no less an authority than Statistics Canada observed that the decline in graduation rates that they had tracked in Newfoundland could be attributed to the reintroduction of standardized tests in that province. It should be noted that in Alberta, which has the most well-developed testing program, there is also the lowest graduation rate in the country. And it also has one of the biggest spreads between the top performing and, and bottom performing students. Uh, their problems with the test are that they force a standardized curriculum so that students that are engaged in special programs have to do their special programs where they try to do enrichment in certain areas, but also have to cover all the standard material. So it, it, it severely curtails any variation um, in the curriculum that's taught in grade 10, and in one case, grade 11. It puts, these tests put enormous barriers in front of ESL students. We get a lot of students coming into our high schools um, that are coming in maybe in grade 8, grade 9, and by the time they reach grade 12, they're prepared for those grade 12 exams, but they're not as prepared for grade 10 exams, in English in particular, which is one of the exams that is required. Uh, but again, it, the real problem is the marginal students, those that are really not interested in going to school and not doing very well, who may eventually, when they grow up, you know, turn their lives around and get a decent job if they have, if they have that um, dogwood certificate. But if they have this, this barrier that puts, you know, a 40% of their grade on one exam in two grade 10 courses, they may not make it through. And that's the decline. That's where the decline in graduation rates in other provinces has had the effect. So it's the marginal students. A final reason that many parents chose to stand with the teachers during the strike was a shared perception that government had not dealt fairly uh, and in particular had not taken seriously the concerns of both teachers and parents about public education. Uh, the government might have been wise to have read a Mustel poll that was uh, done in 2004, which asked, you know, who asked people, who do you trust to tell you about what's going on in schools and in classrooms? Well, people trust teachers to tell them what's going on in, in their classrooms, um, far more than they trust PACs, far more than they trust the media, far more than they trust the BCTF even. <laughs> <laughs> But they trust their teachers, and they had been hearing from their teachers that all was not well. Into the midst of all these, these concerns and frustrations came this most unusual strike. Most parents got it, that it was about public education, and I think Jenny is right that maybe the government has started to get it as well. I'm glad that Vince Reddy offered a way out, even if the door opened just a tiny crack. The point had been made. Public education needs attention. For all our sakes, let's hope it gets it. Thank you.